Well, now that we've gotten all the design work and theoretical perspective out of the way, it's time to get down to the good stuff. We're going to discuss the method behind observational research, the first of our four research methods that we're going to learn in this class. And while I'm sure you'll enjoy this lecture because it's about practical application, I don't want to discount what I said in the previous lecture as being unimportant. In fact, your role in the observational process is extremely important to consider, and everything I'm about to share with you hinges on your understanding of that impact. You can greatly harm your observational research by not considering how your own presence as an observer, perceived or not, impacts it. So in this lecture, we're going to cover three basic angles on the observational method, why we conduct observational research, what to look for, and how to conduct observational research appropriately. And in our in-class workshop, we're going to practice these ideas and do some simulated observation. The why of observational research is actually pretty simple. Observation gives us insights into human behavior that helps us to see how people actually behave, not how they say they behave. And I always think about this like selfies or profile pictures on social media. You look at somebody's pictures of themselves online, you're typically going to see pictures of that person smiling and looking good and holding their head just so to capture the best possible angle, right? You won't see as much in the way of weird facial expressions, unflattering angles, or bad hair days unless that person has a good sense of humor. And you certainly aren't going to see them picking their nose or scratching their behind or anything else that might be perceived as bad public behavior. The view that they present to us is what they want us to see and believe. But if you hang around that person for any period of time, you're going to begin to get a better sense of who they are. You're going to recognize that those flattering pictures that they post online are not how they are in everyday life. And sometimes it completely transforms the way that they present themselves from who they really are. But that difference between their public persona and their private persona can be distinctive. Really, in social science, a persona is a term for the psychological masks that we wear that can shape how others see us. And uh, this comes from the, the field of Jungian, Jungian psychology, where the ideas of personas uh, derive from. And there's a lot of different ways in which we can wear these personas that can make us seem to be somebody that we're really not. I might have a different way of presenting myself as instructor Sean as, than I do as marketing researcher Sean, than I do as dad of the year Sean back at home, or husband Sean to my wife. Understanding that we all wear these masks is central to being a good observer. And we have to remember that there are people who change their behavior in weird ways to account for how they want to be observed. And while I know it's hard to think about a place that attracts broad swaths of public, like a Walmart or a carnival or a demolition derby as being places where people are attempting to mask their insecurities, especially when you see some of the outfits they choose to wear, what we often fail to recognize is that we as human beings make deliberate choices based on what we think others will say about us. And even uh, a morbidly obese woman riding a rascal scooter while wearing a white tube top with pink short shorts and a matching cowboy boots uh, made the choice to appear in public that way consciously and more power to her for it. So why we observe is to understand how human beings actually behave, even if it's in the context of being seen by other people. Well, what then should we be looking for? As it happens, I prepared a slide to help us out here. So some of the things that we can look at would include appearance or verbal behavior interactions, physical behavior or gestures, personal space, human traffic, or people who stand out. And these can include many different things that we've noted here. Appearance can include things like clothing, age, gender, or physical appearance. Verbal behavior or interactions like who speaks to whom, the length of the conversation, languages or dialects, tone, response to direction. Physical behavior or gestures could include what people do, who does what, who interacts with whom, and who's not interacting. Personal space, like how close people stand to one another, or how they interact with each other within their personal space. Human traffic, people who enter, leave, and spend time at an observation site. This is really useful, particularly if you're looking at a retail store or a public space where you're trying to understand flow patterns. And then people stand out, those who receive a lot of attentions from others. Think about the woman that I just mentioned who is wearing, riding a rascal scooter, wearing that white tube top with pink shorts and a matching cowboy boots. That's somebody who's going to stand out in a crowd, right? You're going to pay attention to that person. They're going to really uh, be someone that you're going to notice. But I want you to take note. These 
observational data that you might collect also uh, allow you to make some inferences and you might look for things that indicate membership in a group or you might look for groupings like gender, age, ethnicity, profession, dynamics of interaction. With physical behavior and gestures, you might look at how people use their bodies and voices to communicate different emotions, feelings towards one another, social rank, or profession. You might look in personal space at what the personal space suggests about relationships. And in some cultures, this can suggest a lot, especially if they're high context culture. Human traffic, where people enter and exit, how long they stay, defining characteristics or the number of people can all be really important things to note. And then people who stand out, the characteristics of these individuals and what differentiates them, how others respond to them. So think about Our Lady on a Rascal Scooter again. How are people responding to her and what is interesting about how they're responding to her? <clears throat> so while that slide is not entirely comprehensive, it does give you some good starting points for observation, but we also need to understand the how. And once again, I've developed this slide with some best practices for you. So here are some practical tips for observational research. Do develop hypotheses about what you expect that you're gonna encounter and be willing to revise them as you collect your data. So before you go into any observational exercise, take time to figure out what you think you're going to see and come back and revise them every now and then after you've collected some data so you can continue to look for the things that you should expect to see and uh, have a good framework behind what you're looking for. Do also be well-versed in psychology and sociology of human beings you're observing. So a, a just random marketing researcher should not be doing observational uh, research without having some training and background in psychology and social science. At the very least, go into a workshop or something that helps you to understand how to apply these techniques co uh, correctly. Don't just rely on what you learned in this class if you're doing a really serious observational exercise. Do take good shorthand notes to record your own responses. So make sure you have a note-taking system in place, maybe a matrix or a grid that you're taking notes in and that you're able to read what you wrote. You don't wanna just take photos or videos because you're still gonna to have to take uh, some form of written notes in order to create data from what you saw. Do also have some sort of backup system in place like a second field worker or a camera. So recording is really good if you can do that. You're not always able to do that in observational exercises. So having a backup person who's there with you and making similar observations can be a useful way to ensure that you don't lose all your work if your notes happen to get destroyed. Do also consider merging observation with some other form of qualitative research like uh, surveys, IDIs, focus groups, or so forth. I generally think of observation as being a good opener to any of these other methods because it allows you to uh, have opportunities to look at things and kind of gain perspective before you then start talking to people about them. Sometimes going in blind on certain topics can be really difficult. Um, I also wanna caution that observation doesn't always just mean watching human beings doing things out in the wild. Sometimes it can mean looking at online forums or it can mean watching discussions as they take place or being in context where you are seeing things that are more verbal in nature and not just uh, uh, how humans are behaving in a, in a public space. Some practical tips that I'd also like to offer are things not to do. Don't fall in love with the actions of an outlier and miss out on what the rest of your subjects are doing. And let's go back to my example of the woman on the rascal scooter for a moment who's wearing the outlandish outfit and who's morbidly obese. So she may be very interesting to watch. Certainly is going to attract a lot of attention, but she's also probably an outlier in your crowd. And so if you're paying attention to her, you may be missing a lot of depth and detail from other people uh, that you were actually there to observe. So don't fall in love with the actions of an outlier. Also, do rely on your, or don't rely on your own intuition to interpret the actions of your subjects. So don't just make up reasons in your head about why people are doing things. Take notes about what they're doing and then use other methods to find out why they're doing those things. But don't just use intuitive leaps in order to make that, that inference. Use it instead as something that you can confirm or validate later on through other research. Don't set up a contrived situation to see how subjects react in what we call candid camera style. Now, I know that's a very dated reference. I doubt anybody in this class ever watched candid camera. It was old when I was a kid. But the idea of candid camera was that they would have a hidden camera somewhere and they would play pranks on people and see how they reacted. It was a TV show. And there's been many other shows that have followed that format since. But here's the problem. When you set up a situation where you're trying to see how people behave or respond, 
it's contrived and you're 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 causing them to react in a more predictable way based on the stimulus that you set up and it may not be authentic to who they really are they may also figure out very quickly that they're being observed and change their behavior as a result um, some people have a good sense of humor about it other people get really angry so you're not going to get good data what you are going to get is angry people perhaps um, who, who don't appreciate the contrived situation that you set up or who don't appreciate it when you don't hand them a prize and tell them they're going to be on tv so don't do that. Also, don't conduct observation in a non-public place without permission from the site manager. So if you're going to conduct observation on the SIUE campus in the muck or um, on the Stratton Quadrangle, that would probably be all right because people expect to be observed in those capacities. And as long as you're not doing anything that involves any uh, ethical considerations where you need to get um, institutional review board uh, 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 approval, you're probably going to be fine with just doing light observation in a setting like that. But if you go into a place that's more private, like a doctor's office, or maybe into a, uh, a place where people are sharing intimate details of their life, like a, a counselor's office or something like that, uh, you, you definitely better make sure you're allowed to be there. And even places like shopping malls and, and stores and things like that, a lot of times people don't appreciate being observed without being notified. And so you want to definitely make sure that you have permission to be there um, and that you have talked through what you're going to be doing with the person that is in charge of that property, um, both for ethical considerations, but also for the practical considerations that if somebody catches you sitting there with a clipboard writing down a bunch of notes and they're not sure what you're doing, they may assume you have nefarious intentions and you may have the police called on you. So you don't want that to happen. Also, don't offer identifying information about research subjects without first obtaining their permission. So if you are studying people in the public and you're going to share what you learned in the public with, uh, with an audience, you need to disguise who those people are, maybe blur their faces, maybe um, use pseudonyms for them or whatever else you can do so that you're not revealing their identity. What's interesting is what they did or what, what, what they, uh, how they responded to things, or maybe what they were saying, or how they were reacting in response to what other people were saying, it's not who they are. So take good measures to protect the, the people that you are observing uh, from the audiences with whom you're sharing things, and make sure that you are anonymizing the data as much as possible so that you don't have any conflicts of interest with how you're sharing information. <clears throat> By following these practices, you're going to be well equipped for starting out on observational research. But remember, in addition to your own presence impacting your data, observational research can be an interpretive method. And in fact, I want to bring up this book that I have here on, on the slides here, because one of the things you need to be careful not to try is to interpret the actions of others without validating your data against other sources. And this is a fictional book um, about a, um, a future society that stumbles upon a uh, an old motel and they call it the motel of the mysteries and in this fictional book in the year 4022 um, this guy named Howard Carson is an archaeologist and he comes in and they excavate the motel and he starts looking at everything and he interprets it as being a ceremonial burial chamber complete with an altar for worshiping the gods which is what we would call a dresser with a TV on it but he sees it as an altar and he finds a porcelain sarcophagus in an inner chamber it's what we call a bathtub but he thinks it's some kind of sarcophagus. And he invents all sorts of other humorous stories about the people of the past and even reenacts a worship service where he prays before a toilet with a toilet seat wrapped around his neck because he believes the people of our era did that as some way of worshiping the gods through a pool of water. It's an amusing cautionary tale about the dangers of interpreting evidence through your own preconceptions. And I'd recommend it to anybody who's going in the research field, both because it's funny, but also because it's a good check against making sure that we are not taking observational data and applying it improperly. Now, with all that said, one of the most important things to remember about observational research is to take good field notes and to try to keep yourself from developing an interpretation of what you're seeing until you are finished and you're examining your data. Working with a team that's trained to take notes independently and not to share thoughts until the analysis phase will also help to keep the data from falling prey to early interpretation or flights of fancy. Sometimes observational research proceeds for a while before you develop sensitivity to see something that you never even noticed before, uh, but which is really useful. And when you finally spot it, that feeling can be electric. We're going to talk about later on in eth ethnography, this idea of what's called the hidden obvious. And it is a wonderful feeling when you stumble upon it. 
But my caution is to be careful about moments like this and to always go back and review your previous data to make sure that what you spotted wasn't an anomaly. If you didn't notice it before and you can't easily replicate it using the same method again, it's an interesting observation. It might make an for an interesting anecdote, but it is not a true finding of your research and you need to be careful about it. So with that said, we've only scratched the surface on what observation can do. And unfortunately, we're going to have to move on to other topics in our next lecture series simply because of the nature of our class. But if you're really interested in observation, again, I would recommend that you check out the fields of psychology and sociology and start reviewing the literature for how observational research is used in those fields. Uh, there are other fields that use it as well. Any kind of uh, uh, field biology or um, other uh, cultural anthropology or other fields that involve a lot of observation are really interesting for a marketing researcher to spend more time learning about. And just as I took time to learn about quantum physics and describe it to you, I would encourage you to look at those other fields and learn what they have to share as well.